Anybody besides me know what it means to be distracted? Uh, hell, how about online? You know what it means to be distracted. We've got good intentions. We start a particular day. We've got goals and purposes in our life, right? We no longer want to, you know, be controlled by that substance. We no longer want to, you know, look like this. We, know, we, we, we have good intentions, and we head off in the direction of our best self, right, our, our best experience, and then... That red bouncing ball begins to distract us from our everyday uh, goals in life. If you got your Bible, I want you to go to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3. And uh, I want us to look at a piece of scripture that perhaps potentially is familiar to you, uh, or maybe it's brand new to you. What I'm really hoping is that we see it in a way that we've never, ever seen it before. Because that was my experience this week in Genesis chapter 3. You got your Bible? Turn on your digital device. If you don't have your Bible or digital device, you can join us with the big Bible on the screen. Ready? Check it out. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He says to the woman, her name was Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Do you see what he's doing? He's distracting her. I don't know what her to-do list was, but I know that Eve had, a, had, a, had activities. She had purpose, and she was going about that purpose. In those days, and like God was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, I mean, there was food, there's, there's animals. She had, you have a purpose. And out of nowhere, the adversary, the serpent, Lucifer, shows up, and notice what he does. He begins to distract her distractions how are you being distracted today even right now with your phone in your hand and maybe a text just came in or you're looking to see what's happening later or what's happening on that side of the world distractions notice verse 2 the woman says to the serpent we may eat from the trees in the garden. No, oh, but God did say, watch how she's trying to stay focused. Watch how she's trying to pivot back and to say, no, 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 no. I need to stay focused on God. God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you'll die. <laughs> you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, trying to live your best self will never happen with just your self. Did you catch that? Trying to live your best self. Now, I realize you're an American, you live in Central Florida, and you're educated. And, and you're successful, and there's a lot of things. You look at your two hands, and you look at your checking account, and you're kind of like, I've pulled myself up by the bootstraps. I am large and in charge, and I am all that in a bag of chips. I, I, I get it that there's this sense of individualism as Americans. But how's that working for us? You turn on the evening news, and you can see we are, we are the divided states of America. God didn't design us to live by ourselves. God designed us to live in community and not just your biological family, but people. Eve is trying to pivot back. Eve is trying to push away the distractions by herself. But notice, he, the adversary, he, he pivots right back to get her distracted. That's why we have small groups. It's not so that there's something else to do. Small groups are not a modern version of Sunday school. Small groups are intended to help us from being distracted away from God to stay focused on God. Now, look what happens in verse 6. When the woman saw, now here's another distraction. First, it was the outside distraction, the distraction of the adversary, now it's the distraction inside of her. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, this is not evil, it's not bad, 
she comes to the conclusion this is a good thing. What's the big, what's the big deal? What, what would be so wrong with this? See, we, we begin thinking, we begin processing, we become distracted in our own thoughts thinking that we know maybe just as much as God or in some cases even more. It was pleasing to her eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband. I, I really don't know where Adam was during this whole conversation. I'd like to think to all of the men in the house, if the devil was having a conversation with your wife, you'd probably have something to say about it. <laughs> Do you think maybe, perhaps, potentially, or maybe that's the problem, the silence of Adam, and maybe that's the problem today, the silence of men. <laughs> One lady in the front row said she didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> distractions <laughs> I, d d distracted and so now Adam is distracted sometimes we get distracted because we don't want anybody to be mad at us we want everybody to like us and no doubt Adam's thinking to himself listen I don't want mama unhappy so I'm going to go along to, to get along distractions look at verse 7 then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked distracted up until this point, it was everyday life. They're looking at each other, they're apart. All of a sudden, now inside their mind, because their eyes have been opened, there's another level of distraction, distractions in, in their, their life. So they now have to spend time covering themselves. In other words, they've got to go shopping. They've got to see, does this outfit match? Babe, do I look okay in this? I don't look too big or anything, right? There's distractions. Do you see how just in Genesis chapter 3, the beginning... I mean, think about the world, all the pain, all the evil, every pressure point, all of the atrocities that we see across the world today, they all have their root in the first man and the first woman being distracted. Distracted. This is not an ordinary average Bible study this morning because we've got to understand what's going on when you and I get distracted. Verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from him. Now they're being distracted from being in God's presence. That's what guilt will do. Amen. I'm telling you, that's what shame will do. The whole, the whole reason we're gathered together today, the mission, the purpose of this church is to partner with men and women, boys and girls, moms and dads, no matter what color, no matter how they identify themselves, I don't care anything about their life. We wake up every single day to partner with people to discover that in Christ they have hope. Because here's what I know. There are a lot of human beings hiding today. Hiding shame and, and guilt and you've made your bed and now you've got to live in it. Distracted. Distracted from God's presence. How many of us are distracted from God's presence? Verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man, where, hey, 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 where are you? Adam, yo, Adam! Adam, Adam, Adam! He answers, <laughs> I heard you in the garden but I was afraid, distracted, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were but naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? <laughs> and the man said, and now he gets distracted in his brain because he's got to find somebody to blame it on. There are a lot of us, we're missing out on the incredible... Uh, intimacy that we can have with God because instead of taking our pain, instead of taking our pressure, instead of taking our guilt and taking our shame to God and letting him heal us, we blame it. And again, let me ask you the question, how's that working for you? It doesn't solve it. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God says to the woman, what is this that you've done? And notice he follows in the same exact pattern as Adam. She blames it on the serpent. The adversary never forced her. He didn't tie her down and force her to eat 
that fruit. He, he, he didn't get on social media and begin a campaign for her to eat that fruit. Or, or, there were no parents, so she couldn't blame it on her parents. Right? There were no girlfriends who didn't invite her to the cool girls' table in high school. There, 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 was, there was no excuse except for, I got distracted from focusing on God, and now all hell's broken loose in my life. I wonder what might happen if we would pivot this morning, if we would understand that the distractions around us, they, they have an intention. They're not random. They have an intention to take our focus off of God who will give us the best life that we've ever possibly potentially ever dreamed of. What would happen if we could just get a little more focused this morning? But let's be clear. Being distracted is for real. And you're not gonna just kind of push it back. You're not gonna kind of just work your way around it. We've got to have a strategy. See, the word distracted is, it's an adjective. It, it's, it means it's, it's unable to focus hey, on the value hey, of the moment that's it. Hey, hey, MC. hey I'm sorry. I, I know you're in the middle. Joshua. I know. Did you, did you hear what happened to T-Bone? Look, 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 look. What happened to T-Bone? This is what he said. Thankful for the highs and even the lows, the opportunities and the setbacks. I've never wanted to make decisions based out of fear of failure. You, you tell me the Jaguars cut T-Bone this week? Yes. Shut up. He's gone. I told you. What am I going to do with my jersey now, man? Them Jaguars, they cut Tebow. Frame it. Oh, my God. All right. Thanks. We can talk afterwards. All right. All right. Now, now we get back to this, this idea of distracted, this agitated. It's unable to focus. Hey, hey, hey. I have to pay the visa bill. I just need you to take a look at this. There's a few that On are. Sunday? Well, I just thought of it, and it's due tomorrow. You just thought of it. Yeah. Okay, listen, we will call Faithfully Guided later. We need some counseling. Could you just sit down for just a second? We'll go get some counseling. Oh, my goodness. All right, now, bring it all back in. Focus with me. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, what we saw clearly is that Adam and Eve, they were unable. Excuse me. I got some packages. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Big Brown, <laughs> sir, <laughs> delivers on Sunday. Okay, okay. Could you just maybe put them backstage back there? Sure. And, and uh, um, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Please, would you bring your attention right back in, in here for just, just a minute? Okay. Now, in Genesis 3, we see Eve and Adam. They're in the very presence of God. Joshua. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know you are. This, this came across my feed. I really think you need to take a look at this. Joshua, I've seen this. I know. It's awful. I get it, man. There's all kinds of pressure points in the world. Um, and let's be clear. We must not be distracted that there are men and women who believe in Yeshua, believe in Jesus just like you. And what's happening in their country is so horrific that they thought somehow climbing on a jet plane and holding on to it while it flew over the Atlantic Ocean at 600 miles an hour would be a better way to live than staying in that country. Matter of fact, could we just pause right now and let's just pray for Afghanistan. Father in heaven, um, there are a lot of things in this life that distract us. But I also ask, God, that you would, in all of us as Christ followers here in the West, when we see pain and sorrow, that we would be captivated in our hearts to stop whatever we're doing and to pray. I certainly don't understand why there's so much evil in this world. And to know that there are brothers and sisters in Afghanistan that right now are being sought out because they're believers. They are followers of Yeshua. They have claimed Jesus Christ as their Savior. And systematically, they're being eliminated. God, may you give them great, great courage. And will you open up 
our hearts and our minds and how you want us to come alongside of them and to love on them. How we can support mission work in the region. God, don't let me get distracted with college football and the NFL and all the other things when there is real atrocities happening to brothers and sisters around the world. I sure do love you and we need you more than ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's, that's probably the right kind of distraction. But anyways, back to what we're talking about. This adjective, the word distracted. Unable to focus. That, that's what everybody says about their dog. She's good, man. Check her out. PMC. It's PMC. Come on. It's good. It's good. Woo. See, yeah, man. <laughs> I am not going to be distracted. That dog about took my hand off. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> distracted, right? It's an adjective. You're unable to focus on the value of the moment that you are in. And how many of us in your personal life, in a marriage, a, a, a marriage begins to crack first when you get distracted. Your, your goals financially, in our health, relationally, things begin. We always look at the, at the end moment, but what happened in Genesis chapter 3, before we get to the whole eating of the fruit, before we get to all of the consequences and situations that happen, is Adam and Eve, our first mom and first dad, the first human beings became distracted. I wonder how many of us are, are missing the mark, missing the moment, missing that intimate relationship that God wants to have with us because we just get distracted. We get distracted personally and, and, and professionally and we get distracted physically and emotionally and, and mentally and spiritually. See, here's the deal, is information is no longer a scarce resource into the world we live today. Attention is. Information is no longer the scarce. You, you have your smartphone. Anything that you want to know is on that phone. Any education that you want to have is on that phone. Any idea, any concept, any entertainment is on that phone. We are not lacking today from information. The real pressure point today is attention. Being present in the moment being present in the moment i remember early in my marriage with with linda and uh you know i i thought i was giving her my attention while i had the remote control in my hand and right I, I'm, I'm taught maybe much like you that you're more successful the better that you can multitask and you can get online today and look that, that multitasking actually minimizes your pro productivity. You think that when you multitask that you'll be more productive. Science has shown, because don't you know you're always supposed to follow and believe the science. Science has shown that you have less productivity when you multitask. I remember one time, Linda kind of grabbed my, not, not kind of, Linda grabbed my face and said, give me your eyes. I want your attention. Where you're looking, where you're focusing, is your attention. And distractions are dangerous. I, I hope that resonates a little bit deep down inside of you this morning. That distraction is dangerous. This is why you want to lean up on your chair. Because I know everybody in this gathering, you don't want danger in your life. You, you, you don't want something in your family, in your business. In your, you you want to push back against the danger. You want safety and security. But distractions are dangerous. Have you heard the term distracted driving? Not while you're driving today, but if you're a passenger, as you're driving home or driving wherever you might be, Look at other drivers and start making the note of how many 
are distracted while they're driving. Maybe the person who's driving your car, you might want to tell them, put the phone down. (laughs) Distractive driving. In the Garden of Eden, they were distracted. You probably never thought of it that way. Imagine all the pain, all the sorrow. You, you, You understand all the pain and all the sorrow that you face in your life today. Emotionally, mentally, physically financially, spiritually, the images that you see on the screen, racism, um, uh, all the ways we've, we've hurt one another, right? Every kind of atrocity is birthed in Genesis chapter three. Let that settle on you. The things that make you angry, you take blood pressure medicine because things in this world make you angry. You're disgusted. How could that ever be? How could anybody, that sense of I'm unable to break this addiction and what it's done to my family and what it's done to my life, every single ounce of evil in the world is rooted in Genesis chapter three. And it all started when two humans became distracted. How about a guy named David? Now, you know David is a guy who took care of Goliath. You probably heard a pastor talk about David as the the man who was after God's own heart. But, But what about David? He got distracted. At times when kings were out to war, he got distracted by comfort and ease. And I think I'll go back to the palace. And while he's in the palace distracted, instead of being out at war, leading his troops, he's distracted back at the palace. It's hot one night, so he goes out on the balcony, and there she is. No bathing suit, just bare Bathsheba. Oh my, he got distracted. His mind begins thinking, He texts one of his buddies, yo, man, Bathsheba, she hot, 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 hot. I'm the king. I can have anything I want. Hey, go get her and bring her to the palace. Distracted. He violates his oath to God and one of his own military officers he sleeps with his wife she becomes pregnant distracted to cover it all up he brings his military captain back in to sleep with his wife so they will think that oh they came together and and they had a had 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 sex and now there's a baby and no one will look to me but that officer so committed to his troops said how could I go with the comfort and ease of being with my wife while my 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 boys my brothers are out in the battlefield and he wouldn't do it David distracted to the point where he murders Bathsheba's husband. Distraction is dangerous. How about a guy named Judas? Anybody have a grandson named Judas Iscariot? Oh, no. No no one interested in naming your newborn Judas? Why is that? Because he is the epitome a failure. Distracted, called as one of the 12 disciples. He's an eyewitness to the miracles. He's up in with Jesus, but he gets distracted. I don't think we should be spending the money that way. I don't think she should be pouring out all that perfume like this. His heart and his mind starts getting distracted from who Jesus is and in the presence of Jesus, and he sets off on a different course. I wonder how many of us, you're distracted from your relationship with God. Jesus speaks to this, by the way. It's a huge piece. In Luke chapter 19, check this out from Eugene Peterson's uh, paraphrase, the message. When, the, when he came to the city, we're walking towards Palm Sunday. We're walking towards Palm Sunday. When the city came into view, he wept over it. That's Jerusalem. If you had only recognized this day, the Jewish people were distracted and everything that was good for you. But now it's too late. You've been distracted. 
you've rejected the Messiah. You've rejected the King of Kings. You've rejected the promise that every Old Testament prophet said that God would send you a deliverer. You have rejected him. And notice the consequence. But now it's too late. In the days ahead, your enemies are going to bring up their heavily artillery and surround you, pressing in from every side. They'll smash you and your babies on the pavement. Not one stone will be left intact. All this because you did not recognize and welcome God's personal visit. You were distracted. That happened in real time to Israel. And they went into captivity all the way to 1948 when the United Nation declared that they would become a nation again. But even to this very day, the pressure on this little postage stamp of a country named Israel, the distraction goes back to they rejected the Messiah. To this very day, if you were to travel with me to Israel, only... 20,000 or so are believers in Yeshua, Jesus Christ as Savior. They continue to reject. That's why we have missionaries in the land. That's why we are committed to the work. Not because it's a, a piece on a particular political platform, but because in Genesis chapter 12, God declared that he was going to create this great nation through Abraham. And everyone who blessed Abraham would be blessed. In my opinion, the only reason the United States of America is blessed, it certainly isn't because of our morality. It certainly isn't because we are united as citizens. I believe the single greatest reason that we are blessed in this country is we stand almost alone in the world in support of Israel. And Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, read it. For yourself, write a note. Genesis 12, 1 and 2, God declares that whatever nation would bless Israel, he would bless them. God's warning them. He's saying, listen, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the distraction. They were too distracted to see the Messiah coming in Matthew chapter 24. Write this down. This would be a great piece for you and your spouse and your family or in your small group. Jesus begins to outline in Matthew 24. The disciples are asking, hey, hey, yo, 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 Jesus. You've been talking about your kingdom coming. How will we know when it's time for your kingdom to come? And in Matthew 24, he outlines exactly what the world will look like when he comes back again. And all you got to do is open your Bible to Matthew 24 and turn on CNN and watch it unfold before you. I'm bringing this message. We're bringing this new series distracted because I don't want anybody distracted to the times in which we find ourselves. Jesus says to the disciples then and now, he wants us not to be distracted. He wants us to be focused. He doesn't want us to be like Martha. Remember what happened to Martha in Luke chapter 10? Martha was distracted by the big dinner that she's preparing. Somewhere along the line, we began thinking that activity is accomplishment. And you need to know, activity isn't necessarily necessarily accomplishment going to church more isn't necessarily an accomplishment yes gathering is important the bible says we should gather together but it also says we should step out into our everyday ordinary lives monday through saturday and we should be the salt and the light of the world the measurement the scoreboard for the church in america is not how many belly buttons are on a particular campus on a sunday it's how we are turning back the darkness and the evil and the atrocities in our city in our county in our state in our country and in the world you better believe amen and we become distracted by how big are your buildings pastors we become distracted on how many people showed up we've got to get focused distractions it's dangerous we've had this false sense of of community real community is this you lay down your life for your neighbor it's muscle memory you don't think about it and we have social media and we kind of have even the pretense even our small groups the reason pastor brian is doing community development training today at 11 45 many of you are already signed up if you're not signed up go get some breakfast go eat something and be back for community development training 
Because if there ever, ever was a time where we need to learn what it means to be in a sense of community, it is today. The greatest strength in a marriage is your unity. The greatest strength in your company is unity. The greatest strength on a team is unity. The greatest strength in a city is unity. Why is unity so opposed? Why is it not uniformity? Uniformity is everybody dressing the same way, thinking the same thing. That's what, that's what they're really, really trying to lead us to today, is uniformity. The uniformity states of America. Unity, unity is all together. Why is unity? Why is unity so opposed? Why is unity so hard? Why is it so hard to be in unity and in one accord? Let me tell you why. Because when human beings are unified, they are reflecting the image of God. An adversary does not want the image of God reflected. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three in one. The doctrine of the Trinity is a declaration of unity. Unity is opposed not because the adversary is against you being in a tight brotherhood, sisterhood, in your family, biological, or in your community, or as a country. Unity is opposed because you are reflecting the very nature of God. The goal, the goal for us in becoming attentive to what God is doing is not more activity. It is not more activity. The goal is about how do you and I increase our attention? How do we increase our attention span to who God is and what God is doing? And hear me on this. Many of us have our attention on normal. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. I just can't wait till we get back to normal. Oh, can we get back? I, I thought we were getting back to normal back in May, and boom, here comes the Delta. Hey, put your seatbelt on. There'll be a Delta. There'll be an Echo. There'll be a Frank. There'll be a Gamma. There'll be all kinds of, of variances. Normal is not coming back. Jesus is. Some of you are like, I don't know if I really believe that. I don't know. Hey, listen, then make sure you don't celebrate Christmas this year. Because as much as the Bible teaches about the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus coming the first time, and you celebrate it every year. You celebrate that Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah came. You need to know the Bible talks equally as much about Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah coming a second time. So how are we going to do this? I want to give you just a couple things. You can write them down. Kind of the idea, you know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that the three-chord strand is not easily broken. Why a three-chord strand and not a five-chord, right? We're, we're Americans. Five must be better than three because five is more than three, right? Seven must be better than five. Nine must be better. Why does the Bible say a three-chord strand is not easily broken? And why is a three-chord strand actually the strongest rope because every strand touches itself and the other strands in unison locked in this idea of of a three-chord strand this idea of coming together in community groups what pastor brian is going to be teaching today at eleven forty-five, coming together in these these groups you don't need another activity on tuesday night thursday night saturday night I would not suggest that. One of the reasons I believe God brought Brian to us 
is that he is going to teach us. Many of our small groups have existed, but they haven't been real healthy. We've kind of gone through the motions. We've talked about Tim Tebow being cut from the Jaguars. We've talked about what's happening in Afghanistan. We talk about mask or no mask. We talk about what the school board's decisions are this, but what really doesn't happen is we don't spend a lot of time encouraging one another. We don't spend time in the scriptures. We spend even less time in praying, and we're not challenging one another to take our next step. So in these, in these community groups, this idea is to be a space. What do we need more of? We don't need more to do. Nobody, you're already, there's already too many distractions. But I'll tell you what we do need more of is more encouraging. I'm talking about walking into someone's life and encouraging. It means to place courage in them. What we do need, what we do need is more mentoring we're not going to stop gathering like this this in person or online but understand there's flaws to this model did mark just say there's flaws to like you sitting there and me up here the preacher man you better believe it one is look at the condition of our families 50% of our families are divorced. Look at all the addictions. Look at our country. Anybody overly excited about the direction of those three? Of course not, right? This is important. There's a moment in time, a guy like me standing up and, and being a spark plug, but how much is the spark plug a part of the entire engine block? Comparatively, even the cost of a spark plug compared to the rest of the engine. Now, it's important. I'm not a mechanic, but I understand that it's difficult to start the car without a spark plug. But there's a whole lot of other moving pieces. And so what we need in 2021 and the reason we are positioning us as a church to embrace these, these community development groups, small I mean, we've called them small groups. We've called them hope life groups. Here's the deal is what we need in America today, what we need in Ocala, Florida today, is more than a a sage on a stage pontificating. We need a mentor who will come alongside. We need coaches. We need mentoring. You mentoring somebody and somebody mentoring you. Oh, wait a second, Mark. I don't have an education. I don't have a title, Rich. I mean, who can I mentor? Let me tell you something. Everybody in this room, God's designed you to mentor somebody. Mentorship doesn't mean that you're an expert. That's what I said. We don't need a sage on the stage. We need a mentor who will come alongside and share the hurts and the hangups and the pressure points that I've had. And then, well, here's how Jesus, here's how the word of God. We need, men- we need more. Hey, we don't need more activity. We don't need more distractions. But we need more encouraging. We need more mentoring. And we need more learning. I'm saying this with love. Will you just love me for just a minute? (laughs) Please. Please. We got some teachers in there, right? Teachers. What conclusion, if I were to tell you that 2% of the students in Marion County could read, the rest are illiterate. Would that be a positive or a negative on the education system? Oh, are you telling me that? You're being a little judgmental on a Sunday morning, I think, here. I mean, come on now. Can't we just say they tried? And if you tried, then it's okay, right? I mean, okay. You don't really have to read as long as you kind of say that you're interested in reading. Are you really telling me that 98% illiteracy is not a positive? I don't know this is true of you, and I don't know if it's true of this particular church or the body of Christ, Rich, as a whole, but the Barna Group, which is kind of the Gallup poll of Christianity, reports 98% biblical illiteracy rate. And so let, let, do not answer. Please do not answer. Do not answer. 
Let's, can we stress test it? Doctors stress test things, don't they? You kind of pressure, you kind of push back. It's not just enough as a coach to say, here's how it works, right? As, as, a, as, a, as a salesman, you, you, you have reports, right? They don't want to just hear that you made a call. They want to see how you made the sale, right? All right. So don't, don't answer me. Don't answer me. Don't answer, don't answer me. Let's, let's stress test this biblical literacy. Hey, how much time did you spend with God in his word this week? There's your answer. And now... What's the latest show that you've been watching on Netflix? How about those preseason NFL games that are so important? How about that time on that bicycle, Mark? How about that time in the pool, Mark? How about that time running, Mark? How about, uh, uh, let's stress test it, Rich. Eve had good intentions. No, I'm telling you, God said we can eat from every other tree, but we can't eat, we can't eat from, we can't eat from that tree. She was pushing, Rich, she was pushing back. She was, she was, she was doing her best not to be distracted. But in the end of the day, Rich, did she get distracted or did she not get distracted? Yep. When you're trying to do it on your own, distraction is dangerous. The reason as your spiritual coach that I would so encourage you to get in or start a small group, to come back at 1145 and to be a part of this community development training, to learn, and not just, not a sports term, but you kind of know it as ESPN, but to be into a space where there's, this is what, this is what your small group should look like. And if your small group's not looking like this, raise your hand, because this is how Brian, Pastor Brian is teaching our small groups. It starts with encouragement. How are we encouraging each other? Not talking about the school board. Not talking about Governor DeSantis. Not talking about the president. How are we encouraging? Then the scriptures. When is the Bible opened up? I know we got flaws. I'm in a small group. I don't lead it. I know what we talk about. My hunch is, if we're talking about it in the group that I go to, and I'm kind of like the guy who brings the messages, and they all know that, and they're still talking about Governor DeSantis, and they're still talking about, you know, the, the mayor race, and Manal Fakori, and, and Kent Gwynn, and what's going on, and who's in Palestine, and who's all, hey, hey, if my small group's doing that, I bet you dollars a donut, so is yours. Uh, how about the scriptures? We talk about anything and everything, and how short, how about prayer? And who in your small group is encouraging you to take your next step? When's the last time someone in your small group looked across and said, okay, has everybody, everybody followed Jesus in believer's baptism? Hey, is everybody on a team? Are, are you serving? Are you showing up in our church? Are you giving? That's, that's small groups. I'll leave you with these words from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. I'm going to have to give you some context, but I want you to listen to this, Rich. Do not miss this. Can you hear me in your earphones? Can you hear me in your earphones? Matthew 24 should be a part of all of our small groups. If you're not in a small group, please read Matthew 24. Jesus outlines exactly what it's going to look like when he comes back. He tells this story, Rich. In our language, it'd be two doctors are at the clinic caring for people who are coming in with COVID symptoms. And immediately, one doctor remains, the next doctor is gone. It's the story of moms who are in the drop-off line with their boys, and it's a school day. And you're waiting for the car in front of you to keep going, and he tells a story of how one mom remains and the mom in front of you is gone and her SUV is idling and going nowhere it's known as the rapture this moment where Jesus comes a second time and he raptures the Holy Spirit he pulls the Holy Spirit out of the earth the Holy Spirit's in me if the Holy Spirit's in you everybody who the Holy Spirit is in he takes us back to heaven hey Rich if you think it's jacked up crazy right now in this world with the Holy Spirit here, imagine a world where there is no Holy Spirit. Holding back, holding, holding back the evil. You understand why I'm passionate? I'm your spiritual coach. I do not want you injured. I do not want you. Distractions are dangerous. 
with, with all that teaching that I just gave you about what Jesus says, the rapture, here's what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says. The Apostle Paul, in light of what Jesus, you understand what I, do you understand what I just said? The rapture, there's two people, one's gone, one stays, right? Are you with me? Are you, are you with me? Do you understand that? I mean, no, please, seriously. I, I know you're going golfing, and I know you got something else going on in your day, but do you understand in Matthew 24, Jesus talks about this time where all of a sudden, in a millisecond of time, like a significant part of the population, they gone, they bye-bye. Do you understand this? Now, whether or not you believe it, that's, that, that's on you. The Apostle Paul comes back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 11, and he brings some context to it. Because here... Here's what I'm concerned about. Some of y'all are sitting here right now watching me online. You know what you're saying? Well, hey, Rich, <laughs> let me tell you something. <laughs> if that came true, and there were like two people, and one's gone, and another, and I go home at night and turn on the news, and I hear about all these people gone, I want you to know, hashtag, I'm all in with Jesus now. I was kind of on the fence, but now I'm in I believe it. I didn't believe it when that guy up there, you know, was talking about it on Sunday. But I'm, <laughs> I'm all in. Here's what God's word says about you. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 11. For this reason, at the rapture, when one man stays and one man goes, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. You won't believe. You'll believe the lie. All, all those people who left, oh, they didn't believe in the coronavirus, and so they, we needed to get rid of them anyways. The conspiracy is already being baked in to a whole bunch of people's minds. They're distracting people. And I'm here today to bring focus to you. And I think one of the best ways in our everyday, ordinary busy lives not more activity but more attention is to come into a space weekly with some other people the bible says iron sharpens iron where there's encouragement where there's mentoring and where there's learning 1145 even if you haven't signed up already in the student center we are ready for you. We are prepared. BT, and if you think he's ever been excited before, watch out. He is ready to set us all up to win. I'm going to pray. I hope you have a great rest of the day. If you're here this morning, you've never begun a relationship with Jesus, let me tell you, today's your day. Today's the day. Don't be distracted by anything else in this closing prayer let it be the beginning of the rest of your life as a follower and believer in Jesus will you pray with me father in heaven how I love you I am amazed how you Holy Spirit take Genesis chapter 3 and make it as relevant as the evening news your word is so good and your word says that not one of us can save ourselves. For the gift of God is eternal life through your son, Jesus. And there's some people here in this space and online who need to begin that relationship. So Holy Spirit, cause them to have courage right now. Right where you're sitting, where, where you are at home, will you have this conversation with God? Hey God, it's me. Today, I won't be distracted. Today, I'm focused on you. Today, I believe, I know that I've sinned. And I can't fix it. Jesus, you died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sins. And you were buried in a tomb for three days and came alive again. And today, I'm a believer. I am focused on my salvation in you. Now help me, Holy Spirit, to live every day focused on Jesus. Give me the courage to start a small group. Give me the courage to be a part of a community group. 
God, I love you. Thank you for the privilege of being in these precious people's lives every week. The privilege of putting a spotlight on your word so that every man and every woman here can live their best lives and have hope eternal. Favor them. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray.